there, I am Sfila Beckin, the rabbi from another planet. Please like, share, and subscribe, and ring the little bell so you're notified when new videos drop. And first, accept my apologies, I am an unwell rabbi from another planet today. I am uh, going to be coughing throughout. This is the first time in a few days I've been able to sit at my desk and record this video. But it's probably good that I waited because I think I needed a little bit more time to ruminate on what I want to talk about. And what I want to talk about is this. See, Game of Thrones Season 8. I think it's pretty fair to say at this point that Game of Thrones has indeed pooped the bed. And I've been thinking about why and how that has happened. <clears throat> Which, I have to say, is an offshoot of being a rabbi. Because any type of rabbinical study is essentially uh, studying arcane legal discourses. We're, so if, you know, like, for example, if Jews had Christmas trees, we would have tons of law, laws and arguments about, you know, what kosher type of decorations would like would be, what color the balls could be, what size is strings of popcorn kosher at all. Who knows? So thank God we, we, we don't have Christmas trees because you'll be bored by that as well. But having this kind of like navel gazing nth degree analysis is now being applied to Game of Thrones season eight for your... For your entertainment, I hope. Anyway, so I've been thinking about, been thinking about it over over over, over uh, Sabbath recently. Over, again, being a rabbi. Um, and okay, so let's compare. Let's compare the bells. The last episode, which I think is the biggest offender thus far of season eight. Oh, I live in dread of what they're going to do with the last episode. Okay, let's compare the bells to the Red Wedding, I think one of the most seminal events in Game of Thrones. Uh, so what was it that made the Red Wedding so incredibly compelling? And I think, firstly, it was that you didn't see it coming at all. It was so shocking. And it was like a knife in your gut over and over again as you saw all, all, your, all your characters who you came to love and care about and hope for, and all the hopes for the rebellion and there the being justice against the Lannisters fall apart in front of your eyes. Oh, it was gut-wrenching. But then, after the dust and the shock settled, it took quite some time for the dust and the shock to settle. You look back at it, and it made complete sense. and It totally fitted in to all the characters and the personalities that had been built up. And it was authentic to human nature as well. So, you know, of course the Boltons would have Little to no confidence in Rob Stark's leadership following the execution of the Carl Starks. Of course that would, you know, that's who the Boltons are. And of course Rob Stark would have no choice but to execute the Carl Starks for killing the, the, the Lannister prisoners and being dishonourable. I, I think Ned would probably have counselled him not to do that because he could see that they would look, make him look, lose the war. Um, you know, that, that's who these people are. And of course, Tywin Lannister would seize upon this and he would use it, uh, along with the enticement of becoming Warden of the North, to get the Boltons to turn. And, and, and he would use the animosity of, uh, of the phrase. It, 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 you know, all this made complete sense and it fitted in. And it was tragic. It was so deeply tragic. And it was not only that, it was the way tragedies happen in the real world. You know, what World War One pretty much was unavoidable because of this, it was a stupid chain of events that one led to another, led to another, and it was ended up in this horrible, bloody conflict where thousands, tens of thousands, I really don't know the numbers, tens of thousands died. And it was, as I said, pretty much unavoidable. Now, none of that can really be said of the Bells with Daenerys's. Uh, Knee-jerk decision, which is pretty inexplicable to barbecue most of King's Landing. And really, the only people dim enough to not understand that are Hollywood executives. The core running through Daenerys' character throughout is there's been an element of justice in her ruthlessness. She was, she was the one who sought to break the will. And, and you know, they, it's, what's maddening is they could have seeded this. But going back through Season 7, they could have seeded this this element of insane ruthlessness and insanity um, throughout. It's like, for example, when uh, when the Talas were executed, she could have uh, executed what, them one at a time, and the uh, the Talas' son, what, Dickon, who, uh, the, the, the guy who's in uh, Umbrella Academy, also, also in the first episode of Doctor Who, uh, Matt Smith's Doctor Who, and he was also in Black Cells, a good actor, I liked him in more stuff. Um... 
He's, he, after seeing his father burnt to death, he could have then bent the knee and begged for mercy, and Daenerys could have burnt him anyway, you know? And she could have justified it by saying, I've already sentenced him, he can't go back on it. But yeah, but if you had that element of ruthlessness, and you, you saw that she could snap and do these terrible things, then then when, he, when we got to the Bells, and yeah, the, the King's Landing um, is uh, surrendering... Uh, and you, 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 there'll be so much tension as you wouldn't know that. Is she going to snap? Is she going to give into her darker nature? Which, of course, she would do. Um, and th that would have, it would have worked so much better. It's so maddening. What we got instead was this incomprehensible decision that was out of character, which is pretty much the hallmark of, of season eight throughout. I mean, like, what happened to Jamie Lannister's redemptive arc? What made him revert? Is Arya this incredible, supernatural, faceless assassin uh, who spent literally most of her life at this point on a quest for revenge? Or is she the same scared girl who saw her father beheaded in King's Landing? <coughs> what, uh, and for that matter, uh, I'm going to rant a little bit, but where did the Doth Dothraki come from? That was one of the best parts of the Battle of Winterfell that made, like, got me made of the sea and you saw all their torches go out, their flaming swords go out. I thought the Doth Dothraki were wiped out. Uh, the scorpions are these scorpions, these fearsome weapons of mass destruction that can tear apart ships like they're made out of matchwork and shoot down a dragon in, in, in flight. Or are they pretty much useless? You, know, you can't have both. Even Klegenbol was, was, was disappointing. It was, it seemed to be there just because they want, the fans wanted it. But you know what? We wanted it for a reason. We didn't want it just like, oh, time for Klegenbol, time to do that. And, and frankly, oh my god, make, uh, making the mountain harder to kill than the Night King, <sighs> again, bit of another dumb decision. Uh, like, for, and for that matter, what, so what was it that made Sandor choose to go and face his brother after the Battle of Winterfell? What was it? What, why did he choose then? It was just like, oh no, time to go for Gregor. And what was it that made, that made uh, Gregor like, throw off his... Control and conditioning, stop protecting Cersei, kill Kyburn so he can fight his brother, who he probably doesn't recognise or know what he is. I mean, seems to me he's kind of a zombie at that point. None of these things were orga organic or made sense, or in, in, in any way satisfying. Again, let's compare Cersei's demise to Joffrey's. Uh, no, it's never been so satisfying seeing somebody, seeing a young man choked to death uh, in terror. Yeah, and watch the art life fade from his eyes in confusion and not knowing what's going on. You didn't even see yeah, Cersei's final moments. You know, you, 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 and she disappeared under a pile of rubble. It was just so deeply dissatisfying. And what is this? Another one of your subverted expectations? Yeah, we expected it to be good. That was our expectation. We expected it to be satisfying. We expected it to be good. So... I have zero doubt, zero doubt at all, this petition to remake Season 8 will go nowhere. But firstly, it's hilarious. Okay, it's absolutely hilarious that it's got over a million signatures. And here's why I added my name to it. Because, uh, <coughs> firstly, I know you can only get a million signatures if people individually uh, take the time to register their, uh, their, how, uh, their displeasure, how they feel. And again, getting a million signatures is really a remarkable, a, a remarkable achievement with on, I, with zero advertising, as far as I can tell. They put no money into promoting this um, this petition, and I think it does show you the 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 depth of disappointment the audience, the massive audience, is really experiencing right now. I think greater than. Uh, greater than pretty much anything I've ever seen. I mean, look, people were very disappointed with Doctor Who Season 11. Less, uh, half the audience was uh, disappointed with Star Trek Discovery, for example. Uh, but they're like weird fan people. Game of Thrones was, it was, it is in the mainstream. And, you know, like normal people are like, wait, what? What's going on? And so, yeah, I took my time to register my disappointment, and I'm, I'm elated they got up to, they got over a million signatures, because I, I really think that's going to make these, these, uh, these executives as HBO feel slightly bad for a minute or two, which is the most we can ever really hope for. But, and that's really the reason I'm active on social media, not because I think anybody's listening to my videos. Yeah, I hope, if I keep doing this for a couple of years, I hope to build up an audience. But right now, no one's listening. I mean, I, I, I can see no one's listening, which is fine. It's cool. But 
I, I, the reason I'm doing it is because for the first time in, in human history, us little people get to direct the narrative rather than these massive, powerful corporations. And let's be real, these massive, power, powerful corporations do not like this at all. And I fully expect mass deplatforming to be happening around January next year. But honestly, I think it's too late. Uh, I think once the revolution's happened, it's virtually impossible to put that genie back in the box. But yeah, here, here, here's my uh, my thought on the petition, and what HBO would be really clever to do. They would be really, really smart to not remake season seven, uh, season eight, but to listen and uh, listen to the, the the voice of the audience and make another six episodes worth of material and recut season seven and eight into this super uh, special edition twenty episode final season, remastered final season. Let's call it. Firstly, can you imagine a massive corporation, this one of these massive corporate giants, actually admitting to us that they got it wrong? I, and, I mean, not just admitting it like with a wink, but actually coming out and saying it. You know, as an aside, you've got to feel pretty bad for Disney, even though I don't, um, because I think they fully expected this week to be to, for them to be getting lots of kudos and uh, like uh, scoring points. Be from the Star Wars audience, which they've alienated with their, frankly, breathtaking mismanagement of the franchise. And they thought they'd wheel out this incredibly popular duo of Dan and Dave to move Star Wars forward into its next iteration. And they're like, oh my gosh! The, uh, the Dan and Dave are, rather than being like at the height of their popularity, which they really should be, are utterly reviled now instead. And you know what? Pretty much for good reason. And, you know, all they'd have to do to repair this breathtaking degree of damage they've done to their brands, be it Game of Thrones or Star Wars or Marvel or Star Trek or Doctor Who, is do what us normal people do routinely, which is say, they, they got it wrong, say they're sorry, and, like, have a bit of a me mea culpa. That would do just, just an incredible amount to bring people to repair the damage that, that, that they've done. And, um, and but incredibly, right, I keep saying, but incredibly, despite their massive power, the massive power these corporations have, far more power than any of us individuals have, they're too weak to do it. They're too weak to do what we can do pretty easily. And the, and the real tragedy is a Game of Thrones-style tragedy, in that if they did roll out a special edition season, final season made of season seven and eight, plus six episodes and recut everything so they like it just flowed better and made sense we'll all subscribe to it we'll all buy it we'll buy the dvds and but not only that they'll resuscitate their franchise in moving into the future which they've damaged remarkably at this point making a shadow of what it used to be it's a true red wedding or execution of ned stark style of tragedy in that it's it's inevitable. It's inevitable that it's never going to happen. And <laughs> that's why I think it's kind of apt. My name is Svila Betkin. Please like, share, and subscribe, and let me know what you think.